I just had a Korean culture way this way, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, it is my uh, great pleasure Oops. to have an opportunity uh, to give you a presentation like this. Probably you are not familiar with the uh, you know, metal form. So basically, I'm going to uh, just introduce what metal form is, how to make, and you know, what are the uh, you know, uh, innovative uh, applications, not traditional. So, if you have any questions during my presentation, just raise your hand and we can just talk freely, okay? So can you hear me over there, Dr. Cho? It's clear? Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, today uh, I'm covering a brief introduction of my company and then I'll let you know what metal form and alloy form is. And uh, currently Elantam is doing a lot of uh, research collaborations globally or domestically with the research organizations. Then I'm going to just briefly introduce you know, what we are doing. Then Elantam has uh, some business sectors, region by region. I'm going to let you know about that. And then, depending on the locations, the rest of the time, I'm going to cover the innovative, innovative applications of this metal form. OK, uh, Elantam is a global technology company located in Korea, China, Germany, and the US. And uh, Elantam is the only manufacturer uh, of the alloy form operating on a commercial scale in the world. If I just go back to the history briefly, uh, Elantam company was originally found in Germany, Munich, Germany, in 2004 by a Canada company, Inco, German catalyst company, Sudchemi, and a Korean companies, you know, Korea Zinc and a Korean Nikko. Then, uh, Canadian company Inco was merged into a Brazilian Veleco, Vele, and also there's a, some uh, in, uh, conflict of interest of Sudokemi. So eventually around 2008, uh, Korea Zinc and a Korea Nickel company decided to acquire 100% of the ownership. So eventually the Alantan Co. was founded in Korea 2008. In the meantime, uh, region by region, uh, we have uh, operations and offices. So in Europe, uh, we have uh, sales, marketing, and also a uh, small number of uh, you know, R&D uh, personnel. In China, uh, we built a uh, tech center and also you know, big operations. So frankly speaking, from this year, we are starting to uh, sell our product in the Chinese automotive market. So even uh, China Tech Center has a three engine dynamometer over there too. And uh, fairly recently, December uh, 2012, just a little bit over a year, we opened the uh, you know, US office. Just you know, one man was sent there and uh, he's doing a lot of marketing research and other things. The rest of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in Korea, uh, Seoul and Onsan. Onsan is our plant, very close here. And then Seoul is our headquarters. We are doing uh, from production, marketing sales, and then global research and organizations. If you look at the number of personnel in Korea, we have about two thirds of a whole you know, employee down there. Uh, in Germany, about 10 people. And in China, we have 26 uh, staff members there. And, uh, we have totally about 10 PhDs and uh, 10 master's degrees and 25 experts. Allentown and Allentown's form have been recognized uh, numerous awards and other you know, distinctions. Uh, these are the list, you know, what we have, but uh, the rest of the, the last three, like fairly recently in 2011, Koita awarded the uh, Chang Yongshil Award, as you see here. We are very successful in retrofit, automotive retrofit market in Korea. Then you know, we got the world like that. And then uh, in 2012, this is Konghak Hanimon. This is a National Academy of Engineering of Korea. Uh, our material was selected one of 25 shining materials in Korea in 2011. That was awarded in 2012. 
And uh, the last one was, uh, you know, uh, Technology Management uh, Best Practice Award uh, by Koita. Just this one slide to summarize what alloy form is. And uh, we can just summarize what alloy form is, then we can see, you know, how we can make, what are they, what are the characteristics, what are specifications. Uh, Alantum alloy form is a super alloy containing various, you know, uh, compositional, you know, variations. And also, uh, we have a very thermal and a corrosion resistance. And then this is totally open 3D uh, pore structure. And uh, it's very light, only 0.2 and 0.7 grams per uh, square, I mean, cubic centimeters. And then we have a various pore size. I'll let you know what are the ranges. And then because of, you know, like a light weight, uh, no, because of this porosity, you know, we have a very light weight, over 90% of, you know, porosity. And then uh, we have a uh, dramatically, you know, large surface area, roughly 7 to 13 uh, square meters per liter. If you compare conventional ceramic material, that could be about three or four times, okay? And uh, definitely we have a high uh, thermal and mass transfer. And then also I can show you that we have a design flexibility, uh, mechanical flexibility, as well as the coating, you know, flexibility. Here, what I can tell you is just inner circle. Inner circle is a pure metal, pure metal form. And then outer circle shows the, uh, you know, alloy form. I'll let you know, you know, how to produce uh, really a pure metal as well as the, you know, alloy form. But Basically, we have two metal bases at this moment. So nickel-based alloy and also you know, iron-based alloy. But for the pure metal, we can produce, in addition to the nickel and iron, we can produce copper, silver, or cobalt nickel. Cobalt nickel could be very, very popular uh, in the fuel cell applications. So all, on top of this pure metal, then we can just uh, spray or apply the powder such as alloys, then we can just center, making a you know, homogenized uh, alloy structure. Uh, again, uh, we have a AATM, about 50% subsidiary uh, joint venture with a uh, Chinese company. This AATM is Alantam Advanced Technology Material. This company produces about 3 million square meters of a nickel form at this moment. Then this nickel form, pure nickel form, is imported to Korea Onsan plant. Then at Onsan, uh, we are adding or applying uh, powders that making a uh, you know alloy form. Currently, our capacity is about half a million square meters per year, but we have also an open facility in Chungju. So depending on our necessity needs, then we'll just operate this Chungju probably starting 2015 or 2016. Then uh, this alloy form will be moved to uh, you know, Songnam, our new headquarters. Then we can just assemble about 30,000 units of retrofit cell, and then the rest of them move to the uh, Shanghai then uh, for the automotive applications. Then uh, how to produce metal form? There are various you know, ways we can produce. So, like using a, a, a vapor deposition or liquid metal or powdered metal and a metal ions. Our metal form is combined with the uh, you know, sintering of a powder and electrochemical plating. Then this is a totally uh, Allen terms, unique patented you know, process. So do you know what this is? What they are? Do you know what they are? You can find this one in your kitchen or laboratory, that's a kind of a sponge, right? Sponge is a polyurethane material. It's totally non-conductive. So the way we can make our uh, pure metal form is, this is our pre-format, okay? Uh, making this one uh, electrically conductive by uh, you know, simple uh, you know, sputtering, then we can do electroplating. I'll show you that later. So eventually on top of this, we make a pure nickel form. Then on top of it, we can just powder, making an alloy form, then we can produce in a sheet. 
and the next slide shows the you know, one by one. Again, I told you that the uh, you know polyurethane is non-conductive material, so about uh, 10 to 20 nanometer thickness uh, sputtering or you know vapor deposition, we can make this you know polyurethane form conductive. Then we can move into the uh, you know electric uh, plating bath. So we can just dipping into the electric bath, then we can just coat maybe about 10 microns or 20 microns of nickel or you know iron. Then still polyurethane is inside. So it, uh, this is a poly polyurethane removal process. We can just burn this around at the uh, 1,000 degrees. Then we can just uh, uh, remove or eliminate the polyurethane. By doing so, what you can see is a uh, you know, totally hollow structure. So that means it's much lighter you know, than others. Do you understand that, right? OK. So there's like a dodecahedron or whatever. There's like a, some geometric shapes. But uh, so after making this uh, pure metal into the coil type, then we can move into the uh, onsen plant. So pure metal uh, coil is fed into the uh, you know this uh, uh, process. Then we can apply the uh, you know uh, binder solution. Then we can apply the uh, you know our powder depending on like a nickel, phenicryl or uh, stainless steel or whatever, you know. Then we can just uh, sinter them. So this is uh, like a powder methodology sintering process, okay? Then we can just uh, uh, make a final form like this. This is our uh, unique patent process. Uh, through this, we have totally acquired over 170, 87 patents, international patents. Uh, these are the properties or specifications. I mentioned that, that depending on you know, what are the size, pore sizes of the polyurethane. So right now, uh, our pore size ranges from 450 microns up to 3,000. So depending on the pore size, we are making the kind of uh, you know, size and you know, thickness uh, from 1.5 millimeters up to 4.5. But nowadays, we are also developing much coarser form, like a 5,000 uh, pores. Then we have a, like a, you know, uh, 10 millimeters. Uh, accordingly, you see the uh, you know, porosity percentage, and then also uh, like a, what, what is this? This is the uh, you know, form density. Then this is, a, you can should see the uh, kind of a hollow structure uh, of the alloy form in the middle. On top of it, we can also apply the wash coat and also, you know, catalyst for other, you know, specific applications. I mentioned that we have a freedom of shape. Uh, even though we start from the, you know, coil shape, then later we can just chop or, you know, whatever. So we can make a sheet form or we can make a even cone type. We can have a, like a disc. Even this, we can just uh, you know sit together like a blocking, or we can roll. There are a variety of uh, you know uh, uh, design freedom. If you look at our competitors, there's a cordialite or ceramic. Ceramic, you cannot do this kind of uh, you know design freedom at all, apparently. So, with this design of freedom, this is just a few examples. Only a few examples, you know, what our products are. So we can make a sheet type, or we can have a disc, a mandrel, or block and pallet, and then these are the kind of a specific process how to make it. Take for example, this is kind of a, your toilet paper, right? You can just roll down, then you can just pass your gas through, and then penetrate, you know, the cross section of it. Then eventually we can just filter. That's our you know basic process. Okay. This is kind of a, you know, basically I can introduce what my company is and what our products are. Do you have any questions so far? No? That means it's clear? <laughs> okay. Now let's go to the uh, collaboration uh, on materials research and application development. We are uh, just industrial company, but we are doing a lot of research activities with uh, even government uh, funded project and also collaboration with uh, you know, global uh, renowned uh, research organizations and also domestic uh, universities 
and also a research center as well. So I'll briefly go over you know, what we are doing. So the first uh, I can introduce briefly on the government-funded project. The top one is uh, probably for the automotive uh, you know, applications. Uh, do you know the catalyst, converter, all those kind of things? We are using a lot of uh, you know, platinum or so-called PGM group you know, materials. They are very, very expensive, right? So how we can reduce the amount of a platinum? By using our foam, we can reduce at least half of the platinum amount and then you know, uh, the loading. So that's uh, basically the uh, purpose of this you know, uh, project. And uh, this is almost a kind of a last year. Uh, th that was uh, like a four or five year project. And the bottom one, we just kicked off. We just initiated this one. Uh, this one was sponsored by, uh, funded by uh, Moti. Moti is a Sanopu, right? Moti is a Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy. I think so. Okay. Uh, Moti uh, offered a, a variety of, uh, you know, like a country's strategic research uh, project. And uh, fortunately, our metal form project was funded as one of only one of metal related project okay here uh, with our you know uh, utilizing our higher uh, specific uh, gravity uh, area surface area uh, we can expand our you know uh, surface area ratio this much then we can produce hydrogen using a macro scale and also you know micro scale this is one example, you know, how we can utilize our form for microstructural scale for producing hydrogen. So far, typically, uh, a ceramic pellet has been used. But as you see ceramic pellet, there's a, like a you know, tunnel like this. This is the only way they can just uh, penetrate, you know, some gas flows, right? But our case, you know, as you see before, uh, this is a three-dimensionally uh, tortuous, uh, you know, uh, path. Then we have a much, much higher uh, uh, geometric, you know, surface area. That's an advantage. The other advantage is inside the reactor, this pellet is moving all the time continuously. The ceramic pellet is very brittle, and then they are broken easily. And then, you know, uh, the company or the industry who are using this kind of a uh, reactor, they don't want to make this production stop in the middle. Because uh, once, like a ceramic uh, pallet's broken, then they have to replace it. Then stop it, replace it, we warm up. But our metal pallet never broke, right? So that's an advantage, you know, why we're using. Uh, now, uh, other research collaborations with academia. So left one is a uh, Gangwon National University with a professor Im, Im Songhyun. Uh, this is totally a microstructural characterization using FIB, that's a focused ion beam, and also high resolution electron microscopy, and also electron, I mean EDS, you know, map, elemental mapping. And then right side, the Gyeonggi University, that's uh, you know the comparison of uh, you know catalyst you know behavior, so we can compare the uh, you know uh, catalyst reaction of the uh, uh, cordite versus in our form. The left hand side, uh, we also uh, studied the uh, structural you know uh, properties uh, with Kim's. Uh, I'll show just another uh, slide just a little later. Then Andong University Professor Igian, I think Professor Igian is a uh, you know one of the students of uh, Dean Lee, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, he's studying the uh, high temperature mechanical properties of our Atlanta form, including you know, fatigue. So university by university, I brought to just one slide, but uh, you know, TM characterization, everybody's doing, and that everybody has you know, all these you know, equipment. But the interesting thing is they are doing uh, field ion beam technique, 
by sputtering to make you know, like a three-dimensional imaging and analysis. Uh, this is a, like a you know, high temperature uh, mechanical property test by Andong University. Here we compare the uh, 12,000 micron form and a 3,000 pore size in a micron form. This is uh, just a tension test. Uh, for the like a fine uh, micro form, depending on the temperature, the mechanical behavior seems fairly different. Goes higher, then you know probably it, it becomes more brittle or whatever. Then once our form is coarse, getting coarse, then they are fairly uniform. Okay, that's what you know uh, we found from this Andong University study. And then this one is also Gyeonggi University about the catalyst. There's equilibrium we are talking about. Then you know our uh, form material uh, just set above the uh, you know equilibrium. Then you know that could be uh, you know feasible for our application. Then this is interesting study for the uh, you know pore structure by uh, uh, Kim's. The leader of this Kim's project is Dr. Yoon Jung Yeol. And uh, what we are doing is. Again, we have a uh, size limitation of a pore. The bottom is, I mentioned the 450 microns, right? If we want to make a smaller or you know, finer pores, there's no way at this moment. Because polyurethane uh, foam, it has a kind of a limit of the you know, pore size. So in order to produce a more fine uh, uh, pores, what you are doing is two ways. Maybe using like a press. We can just compress. That's a one way. And then another way is just continuous rolling. We can just reduce the you know, size. Then we want to see what could be your morphological changes. What is a kind of a reaction behavior? So with a 3D you know, CT or you know, tomography, we are just studying this. In addition to this, you know, our current study with the Kims is development of a low cost uh, form. Because uh, you know the economy tells you that you know like a low cost, we have to produce a low cost form. So we are currently doing it, and I cannot show the result in at this moment. But later I can show that. Okay. And uh, also we have a global uh, research uh, collaborations uh, with the Fraunhofer. Uh, this one uh, located in Dresden in Germany, and uh, here you know I showed uh, several pictures, but. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we have worked with this, you know, from Hofer over 10 years, uh, from the beginning of uh, Atlantum Corporation in Germany. And uh, that's the reason we have accumulated so far over 187 patents. Uh, maybe half of them are coming from the uh, uh, older Atlantum Plus, you know, iFarms, you know, uh, from Hofer's you know, invent invention. And, uh, for the next few slides, how we develop and how to optimize our you know, alloy form, okay? Here, the basic requirement, okay, let me tell you this way. I mentioned that there are several compositions of alloy forms, but now we are talking about the nickel, so nickel chrome alloy composition, ternary uh, compositions. This one was very, very workable or you know, feasible you know, later I'll tell you that your know, chemical process technology, like uh, you know, uh, SMR, that kind of a stuff. Then, the basic requirement for the nickel alloy is: the first of all, we have a sufficient ductility. That means we need a you know high amount of you know ductile gamma phase. And the second is we have to have some aluminum. Aluminum is a kind of a you know, sealing, uh, like oxidation, okay? So we have to have uh, some kind of a, you know, alumina you know, format. And then, you know, combination of these, we can just, uh, this is a ternary diagram of a nickel, aluminum, chromium. And then finally, we have to produce this, you know, gamma or gamma prime phase, showing in like, uh, you know, green. And then also, uh, like, uh, uh, somewhere in you know, a better phase, that could be uh, you know, aluminum, nickel aluminum about you know, 50, 50 you know, intermetallics. So this is kind of our basis of the study. 
Then we just concentrated around this corner. Then we got a lot of tests, and uh, eventually we found this composition. This alloy combination is uh, one of the most you know, optimized one. Basically, uh, we have roughly 20% of chromium and 10% of aluminum. Uh, you can ask me then, you know, why, uh, you, you mentioned that alumina is a very good layer, then why don't you add more aluminum more and more? But once you have more aluminum, this material becomes brittle, okay? So that means we need some kind of, uh, you know, optimum, you know, contents. Chromium, chromium helps you ductility. But if you add more chromium later on for the catalyst, the chromium migrates on the surface of the uh, you know, platinum or you know, PGM materials. It's so-called uh, you know, contamination you know, problem. So that's the reason we need uh, some kind of uh, you know, optimization. Then later we just confirm or verified what are the really uh, you know, compositional you know, uh, distribution here. So eventually roughly 20%. You can add this because eventually this is alumina about 10%. And then X-ray diffraction also show that, you know, uh, we contain the like a gamma or, you know, para nickel alumina phases as intermetallics in the alloy. Elemental mapping for the cross-sectional images, we can also form that, you know, alumina nickel, you know, beta phase or other stuff. As you see here, like a beta phase and a gamma phase or a you know, gamma prime phase. One of really important uh, properties is a thermal property, okay? Here, once you see at the left side, uh, this shows the weight gain. Weight gain means uh, oxidation behavior, okay? So you have a more uh, weight gain than you are losing your you know, catalytic or you know, like a effect, okay? Here, depending on the uh, you know, uh, temperature, like a 900 up to 1100. Our gain is about you know, three grams, three milligrams per square centimeters. But, looks fairly high, but our competitors, their gaining is about nine. So that means you know, ours is only one third of our competitors. That's the reason why we have uh, some kind of uh, you know, benefit or you know, advantages. So that's the reason our target application uh, SMR, that's a steam methane reforming, uh, operated 700 degrees and over. And uh, you see uh, oxide layer analysis at the you know, higher temperature. In fact, you know, I forgot to just distribute these. I brought some samples. From, from Professor Lee, okay? <laughs> this is a nickel, okay, I will tell you what. This is a pure nickel alloy. You, it's, you can bend. It's fairly, you know, soft. Okay. This is a pure nickel metal you know, alloy, uh, metal, pure nickel form. Then this becomes a little bit tougher because the alloy, I mean, the uh, powder was applied, and eventually it becomes just more harder. Okay. After hardening this, we just oxidate. Still, still we can bend. Okay. Because the reason the bending is important is, I mentioned that, do you know toilet paper, right? We can just roll it. So you have to have some kind of, you know, bending ability. Otherwise, you cannot do that, right? And uh, another thing is, it's a very soft one, yes. You can just, nickel alloy. yes, nickel alloy, and this is nickel alloy, oxidated. And then, and then these are the kind of a block form. Several layers you can just put together. Even you can see some little dark area. You can just uh, join them like a brazing technique, okay? And then later I can tell you about the, uh, you know, the CPT chemical process. This is a, like a pellet, so like a little cube. It's a three-dimensional opening everywhere. So you can just uh, move it around, okay? Okay, let's just uh, continue. Uh, 
this is another interesting finding. You see the layers here, and then you see the kind of a, you know, elemental mapping or you know, elemental analysis, like a layer four, layer one. Layer four is another alumina layer. This is originally like a, you know, alumina you know, layer. Then through the sintering or you know, just through the oxidation process, then eventually alumina builds up more heavily on top of it. So this is kind of, kind of verifies that this form has a, some kind of oxidation resistance, okay? With a high resolution, whatsoever, we can identify the, uh, some other intermetallic particles. Okay, uh, now I'm talking about the uh, business areas uh, by a geographic region. I mentioned that, you know, we have uh, Atlantam Europe, AEU, Atlantam China, that's ACN, and headquarters in Korea and AHQ. We have just a, you know, office in the United States. We divided our application region by region. Take for example, Atlantam Europe. We have a, a, like a, you know, so-called SMR, XTL, and SNG. All these are like a chemical process technology. We say CPT, okay? In China, mostly about the you know, clean air technology. So uh, uh, like automotive you know, applications, like uh, diesel particulate filters, you know, whatsoever. Then there are some applications, diesel particulate, and uh, also even you know, uh, selective catalytic reduction. Then in Seoul, we are doing the rest of the thing, most innovative things, okay? So, this is kind of a one-page summary, you know, what are our innovative, you know, products. Take, for example, you know, automotive area, uh, we have, a, like, some kind of vehicle after treatment. You know, chemical process area in Europe, we are producing some chemical catalyst. And uh, uh, in Seoul, you know, most of a special product, fuel cells, noise absorption, some other stuff. So, for the rest of time, I'm gonna just go over these innovative you know, applications one by one, as long as you know, time permits, okay? So we have a what? Still 40, more, 40 minutes to go? 20 minutes to go? Okay, let me just go quickly. So first of all, clean air technology. Frankly speaking, this clean air technology is not uh, you know, innovative applications at all, but everybody is doing that. But why our uh, Atlantum form is, you know, like a special. That's what I'm gonna talk about. You know, for this chapter was, whatsoever, I have maybe 200 slides, but I just selected you know, only, you know, five or six to show you, okay? So these are like a product lineup. You never heard you know, all these, you know, uh, abbreviations much, but most important thing is DPF. There's a diesel particulate filter and also DOC, diesel oxidation catalyst, this is oxidation, and then uh, SCR, this is, this is a reduction, selective catalytic reduction, all other stuff uh, you are seeing. So you don't need to you know, memorize all this, but um, here, I'm gonna just take this one as a one of the example. If you look at the, uh, uh, okay, if you just uh, drive around, if you see some trucks, in the back, there's like a you know DPF, you know by Ilgin or you know some some other companies. That's a kind of a retrofit you know market sponsored by a Department of uh, Environment in Korea. Okay, uh, we have been very very successful even before this around 2004, 2006, We were very successful in Europe, so we got some certifications and other you know awards in, as well. So. We had uh, some uh, uh, sales in this till 2012, but Department of Environment just completed this, you know, uh, heavy truck, uh, a medium truck uh, retrofit. So, so at this moment, we don't have it in Korea. But uh, from next year or so, we are working on a, a so-called uh, uh, off-road vehicles like, uh, you know, forklanes or, you know, lift gauge or whatever, lift, yeah, forklift, I mean, yeah, those kind of stuff. 
Here, I mentioned that you know, this is a kind of our metal form, looking almost like a toilet paper. So exhaust gas goes in and uh, penetrates here, then most of like a particulate could be uh, filtered inside here, and then clean air you know, comes out. This is a kind of a basic way. Then what are the fil uh, filtration mechanism? Basically, we have three filtration mechanisms. For the nanoscale or very fine particles, we have a diffusion mechanism. Just going through and it diffuses into. And for the big particles, like you know, tens of a micron size, they just impact. So there's a so-called you know, uh, inertia, inertia you know, impaction. Then the particle size in between, they are doing you know, flow line you know, inter uh, interception. So this, you can see the, uh, you know, this three-dimensionally tortuous, you know, like a path. So going through, uh, most of a suit or like a particles get collected on top of, you know, these areas, okay? And then I mentioned that, you know, in the middle of the, uh, uh, our strut is empty because we, we just burned off the you know, polyurethane. Then we have a very hollow structure uh, which means a uh, low density. If you compare the like a ceramic, ceramic has a very, uh, how can I say, a very thick wall. It's harder to uh, penetrate this. Uh, you can penetrate this, but it creates a high uh, back pressure, okay? But our case, you know, it's open everywhere, so we can reduce the, you know, back pressure. Back pressure is very, very important in these automotive applications. Back pressure directly relates to the, uh, your, you know, fuel consumption. Okay, fuel economy. Then now I can compare, you know, what are the competitors, you know, like a filter, filtering market? Definitely a cordurite in a ceramic, and then another one is a, like a metal foil filter. So metal foil, you know, penetrate this. So uh, the benefit of using our metal foam uh, filter is written here. Uh, definitely uh, we have a low back pressure, low back pressure, uh, avoids a kind of a, you know, heavy plugging, plugging or you know, stopping, that kind of a stop. We have a very low uh, suit blow off, and uh, we have a high uh, vibration uh, resistance. Again, once you just uh, travel with uh, you know, trucks whatsoever, with uh, off-road whatsoever, all ceramic will be broken. But our metal form never breaks, okay? So that's a good thing. And uh, also very light, and uh, I mentioned later some other examples, but uh, it has a very shorter you know, thermal responses. And the uh, uh, PGM reduction is definitely very low. Uh, if you go to the ceramic uh, filter, there are like a two ways, like a so-called wall flow. It goes to the tunnel and that channel and then uh, just passing through the wall. Once you are operating this one, it shows a nearly 100%, 99% of, uh, you know, like a filtration efficiency. But because of this, you know, back pressure will dramatically increase, okay? Uh, compared to this, just a partial filter, just only in a channel, it has a very low filtration efficiency, but fairly good, you know, low uh, back pressure. Our metal form covers just in between. Our metal form cannot make a 99%, you know, filtration efficiency at all. We can make up to 80%, okay? So this is a much wider area which automotive or engine OEM needs, okay? This is another, uh, if we are successful in this business, it could be uh, another breakthrough, really innovation. As you see, our metal form is electrically conductive material, right? Ceramic is not. So we can just uh, flow the uh, you know, uh, electricity down there. Then it works as a, like almost a you know, heating unit. Uh, basically the filters, uh, once like a, a suit or other contaminants, you know, just collect it. The way to remove, we call it regeneration. We regenerate it while burning them, just raising the temperature about you know, 400 degrees or 500 degrees, burning them off, then make them refresh. So 
Once our form is electrically conductive, we can raise the temperature about this much. Then we don't need any active regeneration system. But still, it's under development uh, with a low uh, velocity, uh, low flow rate. Even form, we can raise the temperature about 180 degrees. But air, we cannot uh, about 120. But no matter what, this flow rate is fairly low for the real, you know, reality. So once we are working in like an automotive environment, maybe our temperature rate could be only 20, 30, or something like that. Because there's a limitation of electricity. You know, like an automotive you are using is just battery. Battery gives you only like a, you know, one kilowatt or you know, two kilowatt. That's the maximum. Okay. So this covers the uh, uh, okay. Uh, in, addition, in addition to the automotive, then marine or locomotive, all these things we can do as a, like a transportation mechanism. So this covers the OCAT. Now we are moving into the you know CPT. CPT is a chemical process technology. I like this chart very much. Okay. Nowadays you heard you know so many times, CTR or GTR or XTR. Have you ever heard about it? No? Or like, uh, you know, metallurgist working only steel and iron and steel, so <laughs> not chemist anyway. CTR means coal to liquid. GTR means gas to liquid. You know, our uh, petroleum resources is getting smaller and smaller. So we have to make some kind of alternatives. So this is one of the alternative from coal to oil. Okay, but by doing so, we have to bypass like a syn gas that that produces a hydrogen plus you know carbon monoxide, then goes this way, and then you know from syn gas we can also produce you know uh, methane gas as well. So here process we are talking about is methanation, or from uh, methane to making hydrogen, that's a uh, SMR steam. Yeah, and then fissiotropy. There's a high pressure, high temperature uh, liquefaction, you know, process. So all these three areas, our metal form could be used. Okay. So eventually, this synthetic oil was ever making a diesel, kerosene, and a naphtha. This is energy, and we are also doing some petrochemical as well. We talked about this, right? Then now from syn gas, uh, we are using chemicals like uh, you know material coal or dimethylene ethyl and ammonia ETC. Then this is the first chemical and second chemical binary acetate, you know, or other stuff. Here again, this process also SMR process to making a hydrogen. Our uh, elantan form could be used. The reason why we can use the elantan form on the above you know, processes is still we are competing with the uh, you know, monolith cordyrite you know, ceramic, okay? Uh, compared to the ceramic, we producing fairly low back pressure and then dramatically high uh, geometric surface area. That's a reason we can change this you know, monolith down to uh, this kind of uh, you know, uh, pellet, okay? So, I say this is a new opportunity with the metal form. We are using all this metal form. It is SMR, methanation, dehydrate, these areas, you know, chemical processes, because this one, I mean, metal form uh, provides a 3D matrix structure, no blood pores, and then high surface area, and then uh, enhance the flow, makes 3D uh, tortuous path. Then this one is also important, high radiation heat transfer rate, like, uh, you know, Okay, then now why we are using pellet? You see this one kind of you're showing the whole uh, flows. So a lantern form pellets offer high effectiveness factor, high value metric efficiency, yield, selectivity, shape, whatever. So we have a lot of advantages. And uh, I also mentioned that it's not breakable. So it's very productive as well. This is one example of uh, you know, 
steam methane reforming process to produce the uh, hydrogen. Uh, eventually, I'm talking about the same thing. We have uh, you know, high reactivity, high temperature material, and uh, you know, all these are like uh, uh, advantages, okay? We compare the, in the SMR process, we compare the foam pellets versus ceramic. Again, uh, I show that the uh, you know, surface, uh, geometric surface area is uh, several times higher. Pellet density is very low. Uh, then you compare comparable uh, the size. And uh, this one, you see the ceramic pellets versus our foam and then pellets and whatever. So this one tells you that you know, this SMR process is uh, like endothermic process. Then you know, inside the reactor, the temperature distribution is very, very important. Because of you know, like a high uh, uh, electric transfer or you know, whatever, uh, the temperature distribution is fairly uniform. If you look at ceramic or whatever, it goes like this, okay? So that has an advantage. Now uh, we are talking about the industrial catalyst. Just SCR, so-called, uh, selective, you know, catalytic reaction. We have a lot of, you heard about NOx, right? Nitrogen oxide. That's not good for, you know, our environment. So we have to remove this NOx. By removing this NOx, we are using our form as well. We have to add some kind of ammonium or ammonia type. Then we can just uh, reduce this, you know, uh, nitrogen uh, oxide into just a simple, simple you know, Nitrogen. Uh, it also has a, like a hundred percent open uh, pores. I mentioned several times. Also, it has a larger surface area, weight reduction, and a quick thermal response and recyclability. I will show you this. Okay, the risk of uh, you know ceramic honeycomb installation. Why uh, ceramic has a kind of a disadvantage? Can you see this? Why it happened? It's so-called like erosion. Erosion is kind of an impact, right? So because of the erosion, this is ceramic uh, catalyst, uh, ceramic uh, is kind of broken, right? But ours never does. And uh, also inside the plant, there are a lot of, lot of moistures. Moistures also sagging, then adding more weight, and then catalyst will be broken, okay? I mean the, uh, a ceramic catalyst will be broken. Thirdly, uh, thirdly, uh, even transportation area, there are a lot of lot of vibrations. Okay, so vibration also you know breaks you know these things. So uh, these are the kind of a risk and a disadvantage of you know uh, ceramic. And uh, I will show you just a couple of you know results only. Okay. Here, this is a ceramic SCR. Here, uh, this is a, like a NOx efficiency. So if you're talking about you know, over 80% of a NOx efficiency, ceramic works only 300 degrees up to 370 degrees, right? This is so far you know, what you're using. Here, AF means allant form. 10% means compared to the, this ceramic, we are using only 10% of weight, only one-tenth of it. And then 20 is one-fifth of it, 30% and 50%. If we are working on a 50%, this is a, like a yellow line, we reach 80% uh, percent of uh, you know, uh, NOx efficiency, even 200 degrees. That means we can reach the NOx efficiency you know, available area much faster, much lower, temperature, if we are only using 20%, it's fairly comparable with the, uh, you know, ceramic, right? So this tells you the, uh, you know, we can make a great volume reduction. And then also uh, another thing is, the uh, next slide shows that, but uh, our starting up temperature is much faster, starting time is much faster. So that means once you stop the operation, then just restart it, we can reach that you know, uh, uh, efficient range much faster. This one shows in the next slide. 
So ceramic, it reaches about 80%, you know, about, I don't know, this is 13 minutes, right? But our form reaches 80% much faster. That's what we are talking about. So uh, also it shows that they are heated up to 260 degrees within several seconds. So if I just uh, summarize that industrial uh, alloy form SCR, we can reduce the uh, you know, cost dramatically because we are using lower volume, lower weight, lower coating, and then construction costs down because ours is a very smaller and are lighter. You know, uh, Department of, uh, I mean, Ministry of uh, Environment, they uh, uh, controls our like a whole plant's output for the existing plant. Then they have to add something, right? It's already confined the space. They cannot make a big stop in it. But in our case, we can use only 10% to 20% of you know, ceramic. That's a kind of you know, our benefit. Uh, so that's the installation cost might be down. Denox re reaction much quicker. Heat up, like a shutdown and running, we can do much faster. And a longer durability. OK, now uh, this is a fuel cell. Uh, this fuel cell is very, very important. Frankly speaking, you know, we are working about this fuel cell with POSCO okay, in Korea. So outside, we are working you know, with some other companies. There are various ways of, you know, to uh, make fuel cells. But most important one is like a PM. This is like a proton exchange membrane. If you look at the output, it's only about you know, this much. But this one is for only transportation, like your automobile, like a fuel cell car, okay? But we are talking, you know, very high output to make a power plant or, you know, something. We have to go either MCFC, this is a, this is a molten carbonate fuel cell, or SOFC, that's a solid oxide, you know, fuel cell. There's advantages, disadvantages, you know, rubber, but uh, you see the difference between MCFC and SOFC is Operating temperature. MCFC is 650, and then SOFC is much higher. The reason why Allantam is working on this you know, SOFC is Allantam has a thermal durability over 1,000 degrees. That's the reason we are working on uh, this SOFC. Uh, do you know the, uh, I don't know the, you know, but you heard about DLR in Germany. That's a big aerospace uh, research center, right? DLR and other seven companies make some kind of a consortium to develop their fuel cell. And then they realize that you know, our Allantan form has a much higher temperature you know, durability. So we have already provided the samples and they, they are testing it. So they are working on uh, our form kind of you know, globally at this moment. The way uh, they can use, you know, ours is, uh, I don't know what is the right thing, but uh, this is kind of a stacks whatsoever. They are using ceramic. But ceramic is, again, because uh, this pure cell, they have to use a very thin layer, okay? The thin layer of a ceramic is very, very brittle. So that means they can just add our form as a kind of a, some structural basis, okay? That's what, you know, they are doing. Basically, this is kind of a fuel cell structure. There's like a cathode, electrolyte, anode. And then uh, both sides, there's also a you know, current collector making a one cell. Maybe the thickness of this one cell is about three millimeters. Maybe hundreds of cells or thousands of cells, they're making stacks. Then eventually they are running uh, this you know, power plant, either you know, mechanical bulb or you know, electrical bulb. If you look at current SOFC cell, this is cathode, electrolyte, anode, and current collector. But underneath, they are using current collector right away. There's no way. Because of all this ceramic material is so brittle. Uh, so they are making another substrate to support, then current collector. Okay? So once we are using our Allenton form, we can eliminate or you know, reduce the you know, total thing. So eventually I'll go over, you know, later on. But the current collector, what we need is a gas permeability and the conductivity. 
So like I uh, I'll show you the next slides. Maybe this slide first. This is another sketch of a fuel cell. So this uh, you know cathode area, fuel no no, this anode area, fuel cell is just uh, penetrating. And then this area, you know, uh, air penetrate. Then air and a fuel just mixes and eventually uh, generating uh, electricity, okay? Here, uh, cathode is made, I mean, originally, cathode is made like a lanthanum, strontium, what is that? I forgot, LSM, okay? Combination of the, you know, this poroceramic. And then uh, electrolyte, that's a, like a yttrium, strontium, and a zirconia combination. And another is also, you know, nickel-based, uh, you know, YSG. Those kind of stuff. All these are like a ceramic, right? That's a very, very uh, uh, brittle. And then it doesn't show a sealant, but there is a sealant. But if we just replace this one with our uh, Allenton form, this cathode current collector, we can use the uh, uh, 450 microns cobalt nickel form, okay? Then another current collector, we can use a pure uh, nickel form. So that's kind of a combination. And uh, maybe this could be the, uh, uh, eventually for the current collector, this is another innovation we are talking about. Current collector is a kind of, a, has a, some spinner structure. Spinner structure is a, like an A metal, B metal, plus you know, some kind of oxide, okay? But what you can do is, no matter what, through this you know, operation, all current collector will be oxidized. So we can make just A metal, B metal with our metal form, then it will be oxidized. So that's a reason you see this is kind of a conductivity, and the bottom one is uh, you know CTE. We are developing some kind of a cobalt manganese, or you know cobalt nickel, all this stuff. This is kind of a you know, table, and then this is a so-called really innovative way of uh, you know study. Okay, I covered this right. By doing so, our unit self performance, we are using 100 square meters, square centimeters, and then also even 1,000 square meters, we just compare the performance. Here, this is a voltage, and also this, this side is you know, power of density. Depending, it doesn't matter the size. It just continues to show very, very uniform numbers. So that means performance is great uh, with this. And then also durability tests, we have done with a four unit cell, over 5,000 hours operation is still be there. Like there's some difference, like 0.3, but uh, that's kind of a negligible amount. So this is a kind of a unit cell. Uh, just only a few slides. This is special product. Acoustic absorption, silencer. What, you can say, you know, whatever. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, this is our metal form. This is a polyurethane form and our cellulose. Uh, we compared all these, you know, three materials, but unfortunately, about very uh, low uh, frequency level. So we haven't much time, haven't had much time working on like a much greater, but no matter what, around the mid range, our metal form looks fairly uh, superior to other polyurethane form or you know, cellular form. So uh, what it can do is, like uh, you know, aerospace engine, it's very noisy, right? Inside the aerospace engine, we can just you know, apply our uh, form as a, like a silencer, that it reduces the kind of uh, you know, noise uh, dramatically. That's the one way. And uh, this one, a uh, burner. Currently, you're working you know, like a domestic cake company. And uh, we'll be producing, I mean, we'll commercialize this one within a few months, okay? Uh, starting just only uh, uh, several hundred thousand dollars, but it will grow dramatically you know, later on. Uh, this is kind of a flame distributor, combustion you know, di distributor. We are using you know, metal fiber, uh, Netherlands company Beckhardt metal fiber. 
metal fiber and our you know, metal foam, we just compared it. Eventually, you know, they agree that our performance is better and uh, our cost compared to the metal fiber is about half or 60%. So like economically, it's kind of uh, uh, agreeable. So eventually, we are just uh, 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 commercializing this one within a few months. I mentioned that uh, nickel foam has been made for many years, uh, like AATM, the nickel metal foam producer. Uh, they have made this you know, energy storage system you know, for a long time. And then this is a final slice. And uh, to remove of, uh, you know, H2O2, we are also using you know, catalyzed uh, you know, our metal foam. And the benefit is definitely a time saving with uh, like a pressure drop. Uh, we are selling this one about $100,000, $200,000 to a German company, Metals and Plastics. I think that's it. And uh, in order to make all these slides, you know, my staff, uh, Daniel, Colin, Michelle, or we are just talking about an English name because our global company, but my English name is still Suho. <laughs> So I really thank them, and uh, thank you very much for listening, okay? Thank you.